If you have your Bibles, let's turn together and we'll begin reading. As we said last week, this is a reminder to us, David represents, um, again, this kingdom and kings. And of course, um, he is a reminder to us of the coming king, Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of, of lords. And as the son of David, uh, Jesus was a fulfillment of some of the things we're going to read about here uh, tonight. So let's begin here uh, reading the first two verses together. So now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. This is a little while after the setting last week when the kingdom then came to David and now the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom have come together. And so now the tribes of uh, the men of the tribes have gathered together. It was a great show of power and might and the hand of the Lord that the 12 tribes united together and said, David, we're with you. We stand with you and had a great feast together. And uh, there, um, um, again, not only in Israel, but also as we, we looked at David conquering Jerusalem. And so we're going to kind of carry out the things uh, from this point, from David um, possessing now Jerusalem as his stronghold. And uh, it's right there in the center between the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms. And God's going to use, of course, Jerusalem as uh, the place uh, for Israel, the city of God, the eternal city. And so uh, some of this has to do with that. So. He gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Now he has an army of 30,000 men, much more than that with a whole army, but uh, a powerful show of force uh, with David there in Jerusalem. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah, which is Kiriath Jerim on our maps, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name. So... I will explain that in a minute. The very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would just teach us. These are wonderful chapters here. These are eternal chapters, uh, prophetic chapters. And it reminds us that you've had a plan from the beginning. Um, we're not just drifting along and the cards are falling where they may. Lord, you've already stacked the deck. Uh, you know the beginning from the end. And so from the beginning, you planned to come to us, to die for us in your son Jesus, to offer him to us. And David is a great reminder to us of the hope of the coming Messiah. And now a reminder to us of the coming Messiah, your son Jesus. And so teach us, Lord, we pray. Burn that into our hearts, Lord, and we thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last time we, we read about the Ark of God, which is, again, um, uh, it's a box, it's a golden box, and uh, it is uh, the element there, which above it was the mercy seat, and there were two angelic forms there. The Lord gave the description of what it was to look like, and, and they both had their wings outstretched over this mercy seat, and we understand that as a picture of the Lord. And, uh, you know, inside of it was the, uh, the scriptures uh, there. They put the manna, the law was in there, the manna was in there, and then the staff of Aaron uh, was in there as well. All uh, pictures and reminders um, of who the Lord Jesus is going to be. He's the word of life. He's the bread from heaven, uh, right? He's the coming king and shepherd, right? And so this was a picture. Now, um, it's been years now, almost 20 years, that uh, the ark was moved. It was taken by the Philistines. And then it was moved back into Israel, sent back into Israel. And then they, they put it, um, uh, tucked it away there. Um, and it had been there for the last 20 years. But like I said, the spiritual life of Israel is really broken down. And even under Saul... Uh, there was a little bit of a resurgence, but 
not the spiritual transformation. David is bringing that in. And what does David want to do? He wants to worship the Lord. So he has it in his heart that he wants to bring the ark into now Jerusalem. Again, this is, this is the heart of the Lord as well. Again, strategically, now the worship will be in the, you know, right there at the uh, top of the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. It's actually in the land of Benjamin. But then also there for the access of the northern tribes as well. And so this is a uniting work that's gone on. This is the divine hand of God that he has had him take the city of Jerusalem. All this time they've been in this land, they've never taken the city of Jerusalem. It was always a stronghold they couldn't take. And now God has given David the power and the wisdom, the strength to take this city. And now it becomes, uh, you know, the eternal city of God, Jerusalem. And we, we see so much more than they see. But he want, that's the heart of David. And so he's gone up to gather this ark and to bring it in. Now, there's some spiritual things here and some physical things that are going to go all throughout the Bible and still yet to be fulfilled, some prophetic things. So let me just give you a quick overview. Jerusalem was once the ancient city, or was the ancient city of Salem. Salem. So in our Bibles here, we remember where King Melchizedek, right, the king of Salem, he came out to who? To Abraham. Now that goes back a, a long way from the beginning of the covenant of God with Abraham. And so this king comes from Salem, and he offers there what the Bible says in Genesis 14. This is Enmel, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Not just to, to um, Abraham after this great victory that he'd won, but also the kings, the southern kings were all there as well. And so this, this man comes, this king of Salem, Melchizedek, he shows up and he offers bread and wine here in celebration. The Bible says he was a priest of God Most High. So we always think of the kingdom or the priesthood of Israel, but, but there, were, there were other Gentiles on the face of the earth who were also godly men and represented the Lord. Now, some people think this is Jesus showing up, but again, we do have a physical location that he was king, and some people say, well, that's just a reference to, to a, a, a later, you know, um, Jesus um, coming along. But I think it was a man that was there. And what, he's, what he did was he came out and he represented this future promise of Israel, but also to these other kings that he was a kingly priest. He was a king and a priest. And it says he blessed him and he said, blessed, blessed be Abraham of God most high. It's linking the two together. Possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then the Bible says Abraham gave him a tenth of all. So he uh, uh, gave that as an offering unto the Lord. And so he was called the priest of the most high. So this links the king line and the priestly line together in this city called Salem. And now we see David here as the king and he is the being crowned king and one of his first things that he wants to do is he's not a priest because he's not of the tribe of Levi, he's of the tribe of Judah, but he's acting like a priest. He's he wants to worship as a, a priest would, and to lead people into the worship of the Lord. And so we're going to see David being a representation of a priestly king. And again, who's also something we look toward to the coming of Jesus, who was a prophet and a priest and a king, wasn't he? And uh, he's the king of kings, but also he's our great high priest. So there's a lot of imagery that's here. It's a um, beautiful picture. And uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, it says, having been made perfect, this is Jesus, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. 
being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So I'm going to explain some more. You might remember it. You might not remember it. But it, Jerusalem is a spiritual city and a physical city. And there's physical promises that have to do with Israel there within that city. And there's also spiritual pro, uh, um, prophecies uh, that have to do with uh, uh, Jerusalem. And so we're going to try to look at both of those um, here, physical promises and spiritual promises, as we look for the future, God's future plans, not only with David, but the one who would follow David, which is Jesus. So we're kind of getting to some neat parts of the New Te uh, Old Testament that start to really unfold some of the things about Messiah and uh, Messiah being a savior, but Messiah also being a king. And so we'll take a look at that um, tonight. Now, um, as we can picture this king priest Melchizedek standing with Abraham and the kings of the south, we can also picture Jesus one day. Um, we can picture him in a couple ways. We can picture him standing there um, as uh, in Jerusalem, right? Uh, which he will one day. But also the Bible says in the future sense, Jesus will be a king in Jerusalem during the millennium. That's yet ahead of us. And he'll come and he'll be king. We can picture him standing there in the millennial temple in Jerusalem. And um, Ezekiel speaks about the building of that um, physical temple, the rebuilding of it and that for the rule of Christ for a thousand years, and the kings of the earth entering into it. So you'd have the King David, he'll be a part of that, uh, Ezekiel says, as being the prince there um, as for people coming in, and then the kingdoms of the earth. So what's happening is not only happening for Israel, but it's also a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Just as he said to Abraham, you'll have descendants, There'll be physical descendants that'll have a promise of a land, but there'll also be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. And uh, that is the eternal life that Jesus gave, not only to Israel, but to anyone, all of the Gentiles who would accept it. So I know it's a little bit complicated, um, but a um, little bit of a kind of a um, uh, future look uh, here of what we're going to be reading about uh, upcoming. So, Verse 2 says, the ark of God, which was called by the name. Called by the name. What name is that? Well, Israel um, knew the name of God was so holy, and they treated the name of God so holy that they didn't even want to say it. And so they would just, uh, uh, this ark of the covenant is the ark of God, and God is holy. So they call it the ark of the name. And uh, we know that name is as being Yahweh or Y-H-W-H. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. And God explains who he is. And, and so we don't really know exactly what that name is because they wouldn't write the vowels there. We just see the Y-H-W-H. And so um, some people pronounce that Yahweh. Um, some people pronounce that Yehovah. And uh, the same uh, idea of these vowels uh, putting together the name, but they would use that name, however they pronounce that, when they would speak of this ark. Now, what is the ark? It is, to Israel, the presence of God. It's the most holy article on the earth, the physical thing on the earth. And of course, when they see it, they, they would often be able to see it as the priests would take it out uh, in the tabernacle, and they would be moving the tabernacle to a new place. So the Shekinah glory would move forward for Israel, and then they would begin to, to take down the tabernacle, and then the only the line of the priests, the Kohathites, they would grab a hold of the ark and put the poles through the little rings there on the ark, and they would lift it up, and they would carry it to where the Lord stopped. Now, wherever it was that the priest would have to carry that and set that down, and that would become the Holy of Holies. And then they would build the tabernacle around it. But it was the very presence of God. So I want us to see that too as we start this section, uh, because that's what it is. 
That's how Israel should see the ark of God. And that's what our text says. Listen, they name it uh, something holy like this. Now, what's interesting is that's going to eventually stop on the Temple Mount. It's not going to end up there tonight, but it will end up there because that's going to be a physical house that's made not just a tabernacle, a tent. It'll be a house that's going to eventually be made there in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount. And so um, the dwelling place of God would be on the Temple Mount there inside of the temple in the Holy of Holies. So all of this is an imagery. And as we'll see here, um, here's what Exodus 25, 22 says. He says, I will meet with you, God said to Israel, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which is described here, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in the commandment for the sons of Israel. And so that's the very dwelling uh, place of God. Exodus 25, 14 says, You shall put poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. And then later on in Numbers, uh, Numbers 4, it says, When the camp is to set out after the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them, he says, So that they will not touch the holy objects and die. So, Israel understands this, at least in their history and through the Word of God. But, but then they've lost a lot of that because they haven't been carrying a, a, lot, a lot of these things out. And with it, they've kind of lost the sense of the holiness of God represented here uh, in these articles. What's interesting also is that as God dwells in the Ark of the Covenant, that's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? And uh, Jesus came to dwell on earth too, didn't he? And John, in his First uh, John chapter 1, excuse me, not First John, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. So later on, we're going to see Jesus literally dwelling with man, God's presence dwelling with man on earth. And Jesus will be at times in his life, before the end of his life, standing there on the Temple Mount, at the temple, talking to men about the dwelling of God and the presence of God. And he is the presence of God. And John said, and we saw his glory. Glory as the only God begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They realized God came to dwell with us. So all this is pictorial, but it's real. And God wants to dwell with man. And of course, now where's the temple? The temple's in our hearts, in our lives. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's he dwells inside of us. So God tabernacles now with us, doesn't he? And he comes in. Jesus said, listen, I'll send the Holy Spirit. He'll be with you. Uh, he's with you now, but then he'll be in you. I will come to you. The Father will come to me and we will be in you. So that's an exciting uh, thing there. I don't think we think of our bodies as a holy temple of the Lord, but we should. And we're going to see that they're going to underestimate the holiness of the Lord but um, so do we. And so it's good to, uh, to be reminded of all of that. So um, wonderful, wonderful picture. Verse 3, they placed the ark of God on a new cart. So David has gone over to Kirith Jerem. He's gone to go get this ark. And they, uh, they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and ah Ahio the sons of Abinadab were leading the new cart. So they brought it, the cart, with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. And as we'll see, Uzzah was walking beside the cart. And so they put this uh, on the cart. Now, we're assuming that they put the poles in it, lifted it up onto the cart, and then now they're walking alongside the cart uh, there, um, and David is, has this plan to transport it that way into uh, Jerusalem. Now, why a cart? As we'll see, David hasn't sought the Lord on how to move the ark. They should have known that the priests should have carried the ark, uh, 
Um, but why did they put it on the cart? Well, because the Philistines put it on the cart. <laughs> the Philistines, remember, they were trying to get rid of the cart. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, because they were being um, uh, cursed through it uh, there. And they were getting boils. And remember, they talked about the rats. And so they put some golden bo- forms of boils in the cart as well. And these golden rats. As, and they, and they, they did it so, uh, in such a way that uh, it would be supernatural if the cart went over to Israel into the land of Israel because they put, they led it, it was led by two um, um, heifers uh, that were still being weaned. And so um, they said, well, man, if these two heifers will walk out away from their mamas and go the other direction, we'll know this is divine and by God's hand. So, of course, it was, and, and these uh, uh, two um, cows took this cart over the hill. In fact, they watched and made sure that it got over there to Israel. And so now David is using this cart to uh, bring this uh, thing back. So that's kind of the setting for all of this. Who are the sons of Abinadab? Well, I believe that they're priests. Uh, The house of Abinadab is the priestly line. And so they were priests. So there's nothing wrong with that portion of it. But as priests, they should have known uh, very much so how you handle Uh, the presence of the Lord. Now, it's been there 20 years in their house, okay? So there should be a sense of that reverence of that. But sometimes after 20 years, you've lost the sense of reverence, haven't you? So with that, we read the verse five. Meanwhile, David and all the uh, house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood. Uh, Dan, not sure what you're... Your uh, guitar is made out of, is it fir wood? Okay. And with lyres, harps, tambourines, uh, castanets, and cymbals. Uh, Again, another reminder to us, the Lord loves a wonderful celebration musically. But when they uh, came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. So what happened was it, it jostled, The ark was going to tip over, so Uzzah reached out to stabilize it and want it to fall, and he touched it. It says, and the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there uh, by the ark of God. Now, when we read that, we just go, Lord, you know, you just ruined a great day. I mean, this is a day that David, in his heart, and there's nothing wrong with David's heart, he wants to bring the ark in, he wants to worship the Lord to be national and to restore the worship of the Lord. So there's nothing wrong with that. But this picture was marred by this man reaching out and casually bracing uh, this, which again represents the very holiness of God Almighty. And, uh, and so here's a little a note from kind of a little scripture thing I was reading. It says, what, what God's action, uh, was God's action too severe? We feel free to judge God because we lack a sense of his awesome holiness and majesty. The ark was as close to a visible representation of God as men would see until Jesus. Nothing that represents more of the holiness uh, and uh, person of God than this article, the ark. Uzzah disregarded this. His death was a lasting lesson to the Israelites to take seriously the glory of their God. Do our language and our actions demonstrate that we mean it when we pray? Hallowed be thy name. God, you're holy, you're awesome. And it's a good reminder to all of us. I think we can lose the sense of how holy and awesome our God is. We only have a relationship with Him because of His perfect sacrifice of His Son. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any way to reach out and touch God, would we? Or to be able to have a relationship with God um, because we are sinful. And of course, Uzzah was a reminder there that Israel was not to be casual um, here in, in the worship of the Lord. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle was to be honored and respected. And again, for centuries now, they've been disregarding that. And again, the priesthood fell into 
disarray because of the sons, right, of Eli and the wickedness that was going on there. And so this is a great reminder. But what happens to David? Verse 8. Maybe it's happened to you. It says, David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day, uh, which means the breakout of wrath of God. David named it. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So, um, Obed-Edom, again, uh, could be a reference to um, a city there, was in Gath, but it was uh, to be a Levitical city. And so David tucked it away there until he could figure out what the Lord wanted and what did he do wrong and all of that. Now, David was angry. What was his anger? Now, um, I don't know if you've ever been angry with the Lord, okay? Now, that's a waste of time. And it's, there's nothing profitable in being angry with the Lord because there's no reason to be angry with the Lord. If we know who the Lord is, we shouldn't be angry with Him. Now, in our humanness, we don't see everything, and so we can get angry with the Lord because we don't know what He knows. Now, it's possible that from David's perspective, he was angry like the Lord had done something wrong, but I don't think so. I think this anger that he had there was, again, over the things that he had done. He probably realized, I didn't do this right. I'm supposed to represent uh, um, the Lord to the people, and now I've done this carelessly. I brought it on a cart. All these things are probably starting to head home. What are we doing? Uh, the Bible clearly tells us what to do. And so this is really David, um, again, understanding, Lord, I've missed it somewhere. Now, um, this, is, uh, this fear of the Lord is a holy fear and a needed one. God, you're holy, you're awesome. I've treated you in a way that was not uh, in your holiness. And again, David had a heart after the Lord. And so we, we see that he realized what he had done was not right. And um, anger against the Lord is misdirected anger. Um, we don't always understand all the things that happen to us, but God sees them all perfectly, doesn't he? And uh, the things that God allows into our life, trust me, He knows He's allowing them into our lives. doesn't mean God's doing them, but God allows a lot of trials and hardships and things we look at and we just go, Lord, I don't, I don't get this. But we always have to go back to the true nature of who God is. So for me, when I'm praying, example, like this week, prayed with both of the families who've lost someone Again, both, both deaths were sudden and really without reason. Auto accident, not even your fault, boom, you're gone. You know, another thing, medical situation, you're there, you know, next moment you're gone. So how do you deal with that? Um, for me, I don't try to make, uh, find an answer because... I don't know the answer. God knows the answer. But what I do know is I know God. And I know in the middle of this that he is, he's, he's there. And He's there with us. He understands the situation and He loves us and cares for us. But here's my perspective as a pastor. I want them to go and to see the Lord for who He is in this. It's so always critical at that moment of where you go. If you just decide to be angry... Um, then you're going to head off on a path that's going to be destructive and it's misplaced. Um, like we read before, our days are numbered. Only God knows the number of days. One day when we stand before the Lord, we know this. He's good. He's righteous. Um, he sees everything from beginning to end. We don't know uh, uh, what the days would have been in, in their lives. So we leave all of that in the hands of the Lord. But it's important that we see things the way the Lord sees them. 
And for David, he's going to go back now and seek the Lord and say, Lord, where are you in all of this? And again, um, what do we do with all of our questions? Can we trust God's oversight of our lives? That's when things are really tested, aren't they? Boy, it's sure wonderful to walk through with families who love the Lord because both families were like immediately going to God. Brokenhearted, but God, I know I... I trust you in the middle of this and, and I know that you love us. How do we know he loves us? Because he offered his own son to die in our place. He could not love us any more than that. And God's plan is not for us to have physical life forever, is it? So Uzzah was gone, but it doesn't mean he was gone and separated from God forever. Um, there's an eternal life that's there. We got to live life as if it's eternal. Otherwise, we try to hold on to every day as if it's ours or if it's all that we have. Listen, it's not all we have. We have eternal life forever, an unlimited amount of days. So it doesn't matter how many days on earth I have, I have forever with the Lord. And it's good when we can lift our eyes back again and say, listen, we're going to be meeting again together. Some of us have lost loved ones, lost children maybe, or our parents or uh, siblings and uh, uh, things that were still in our hearts. Every day we think about that. But, but our hope is in the Lord. And our hope is to be with the Lord one day and there's gonna, we're going to be together again. Somebody mentioned that as um, David's going to say later, when he loses his child, he's going to say, um, um, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. So he knew that one day I will meet uh, my son again, uh, but not here, but there. And that is great hope. And so David's situation is a little bit different here. They do understand why God um, took out Uzzah there. And it was very important that Israel respects and honors uh, in a physical way, the purity and awesomeness of the Lord. Verse 12, now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness, with joy. Now he sought the Lord. Now he's got the Lord's will on things, and they're going to do it the Lord's way. And so it was when the bearers of the ark, there you go, a couple of priests bearing the ark as they should be, of the Lord had gone six paces He sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod or really like a priestly robe. Again, this is a picture of David in his priesthood uh, there. And so this was so important that they honor the, um, uh, the purity and holiness of the Lord that as soon as they took six steps, they stopped and they just made, made a whole sacrifice unto the Lord. You can just see the difference in their hearts here and a reverence for an awesomeness for God. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. And David, again, is um, expressing himself outwardly, isn't he? And he's uh, um, um, dancing before the Lord and he's singing uh, uh, to the Lord. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Now, this is an interesting display of worship, isn't it? Can you picture it? And David is there before all of the other priests and the singers and those playing the instruments, and they're dancing before the Lord. And David is completely out of his kingly position, isn't he? And he's like just one of the people who's like, I just want to express my love and and relationship to the Lord. And it was beautiful and it was holy and it was wonderful. And and it was filled with the reverence of the Lord and with the truthful obedience to the Lord. And then also with this expression, outward expression, of singing and dancing before the Lord. Some of you are like, oh, I would never. Well, maybe you should, right? 
I mean, this is one of the places in the Bible where you really can't go, well, I, I should never. Well, David did. Are you better than David? Um, and David is expressing it. But it's an interesting thing on, on holiness. What I think um, today a lot of what we call worship is, is not necessarily meeting all of the categories. I think a lot of times we neglect the first two. When we think of worship, we think of just the singing and the outward expression uh, there before the Lord. And we call that worship. But worship is more than that, isn't it? It's the other things that are the holiness, acknowledging the holiness and reverence of the Lord, and also with an outward physical, um, um, excuse me, with a um, truthful obedience to the Lord. In other words, David wanted to make sure his heart was right before the Lord, that he was reverencing God for his holiness, and then his outwardness uh, worship reflected that inwardness. And I think sometimes we look for the outward part of it today and we celebrate that outward expression without the other two uh, there. And, uh, and that's one of the issues, I think, um, that we see a lot in the church today. And I think Israel had to learn that lesson, but David had all three going on. And the Lord wants us to worship Him, not only in spirit, but also in truth. And so we have to have both of those things there. And so we can worship the Lord all we want and be demonstrative and say all the things that we want to say. But if our heart is far from the Lord, we're not obedient to the Lord, and we don't reverence the Lord in His holiness, then that's not worship unto the Lord, is it? The physical part is uh, only the secondary part to those other things. And too many churches today, I think, they think of worship as that, you know, outward expression and the musical, joyful part of it, which is wonderful. Um, but I think the Lord wants the other part uh, more than anything, is us to uh, reverence Him to be uh, and uh, to, to have our lives set apart unto Him. Now, let me also say that many a people are unwilling to do the second portion. So both of them are true. Um, there is a time to corporately gather and to worship the Lord. I watch you from the back as you worship the Lord up here. And again, I'm not saying we need to dance uh, and make a, a dance uh, here uh, um, thing, but um, there should be, it's okay to do an outward physical expression to the Lord. doesn't make it more holy, but it is an expression of our humanity and the, the, the way that the Lord has made us. And David wanted a reflection of that. He wanted the, the music uh, there, the worship to be there before the Lord. And so it's really a, um, a fullness of that picture. So file that one away in your mind. If you're afraid to you know, lift your hands before the Lord or to sing out loud, we don't want to have this kind of attitude like Michael had. And again, she looked at that and said, well, that's disrespectful. And again, she was... Her heart was not a heart toward the Lord. And she looked at that and said, what a fool he's made of himself uh, that day. What kind of a king uh, are you? Verse 17. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings uh, before the Lord. Uh, this isn't the final place, but uh, this is the place where David's going to uh, we're going to put the tabernacle there in Jerusalem. And so he set everything up, and now he's going to need to institute all of the priests. So when David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people and to all the multitude of Israel, both to men and to women, a cake of bread uh, and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed to each person's house. Boy, what a great day that was. What a great day of worship. What a great day of celebration. And then they have this little treat on the way out. Um, it just really couldn't get better than that. What a great, fantastic day. But not everybody felt like it was such a great day because verse 20, but when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, boy, she's an interesting lady, isn't she? little firecracker in some ways. Um, David wanted her back. <laughs> and so he, remember last week we saw that he, he told him, he said, listen, well, if we want to make a covenant with you, you need to give my wife back. And, uh, and so 
um, Saul's son went and got Michael and brought him back. Remember the husband was walking along kind of uh, whimpering a little bit and then he, they sent him home. So now he's got her and now this. And so came out to meet David and she said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. That was quite a show you put on. And in her eyes, that's the way she saw it because she didn't have a heart after the Lord. And uh, says he uncovered himself Uh, he, speaking of David, uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants, maids. (laughs) She's thinking about the ladies, how they were looking at David. And as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. David knew who he was, didn't he? He said, listen, this is the God who called me out of the sheep pen and he called me to be a king for him and to represent him. How dare I let his presence come into this city without worshiping with him with all of my heart. And uh, she accused David really of exposing himself. Sometimes we look at it and we say, oh, was he just wearing like a a skimpy something. No, no, he's wearing a priestly garment. In fact, it's interesting because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, here's what we're told. It says that David was also wearing a royal robe under the ephod. So though he was not from the tribe of Levi, David was acting as both priest and king. And so it's Chronicles says this, now David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and with all the Levites who were carrying the ark, a priestly garment. And the singers and the, I don't know who they are, Chananiah, the leader of the singing with the singers. David was in the middle of all the singers. David also wore an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel uh, brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound, the sound of the horn, with trumpets, with the loud sounding cymbals, with harps and lyres. It happened When the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. So he had both of them. He was representing the priesthood and uh, his kingship as well. Um, So it really wasn't about the outward appearance. It was about what he was doing. And uh, again, she looked at it as embarrassing and shameful and uh, in in a jealous way as well. So... Verse 22, I will be more lightly esteemed than this. You haven't seen anything. You haven't seen the the final thing yet. I'll do more than this. He says, and will be humble in my own eyes, but with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. In other words, I know uh, the difference between the two. Uh, With the Lord, I'm humble in his sight. And with the maids of Israel, uh, again, I know my place to, to be honorable. And so he set her straight. It says, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. So I think God weighed in at that. And uh, the Bible doesn't say he held that against her in the sense that he didn't go into her. And, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. It just says that God dealt with that. He, he continued to be her, uh, her husband, but God weighed in uh, that way. And so... Um, uh, eventually it came out for who was uh, right before the Lord, right? Um, and a beautiful, beautiful day there for David. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now it came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all of his enemies that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. Remember the cedar from Lebanon? Once they declared David the king, the people up in Lebanon, they began to bring gifts to David and people from all over began to bring gifts. They recognized his kingship, also his power. And so David had built this beautiful palace. And he says, listen, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. So Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind for the Lord is with you. Now, David, as in his mind, I want to build a house for the Lord. He says, but in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, 
the prophet, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? So he lays that out as a question. Just let us, David, I know your heart. I know what you want to do, but are you the guy that should build the house? So um, that starts something that the Lord wants to communicate. Verse 6, he says to Nathan, For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. In other words, has anybody built me a house in the last couple hundred years? No. But I have been moving about in a tent even in a tabernacle, uh, wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I, I commanded uh, to shepherd my people Israel, saying, speaking to the, Israel, uh, the uh, Levites, uh, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Did I ever complain? Have I asked for a house? And so there, now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from the following, uh, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. What he's going to do is God's going to remind David, listen, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. I got a plan for you, David, and you're a key part component in my house. And uh, that's going to be the house of David uh, here in the city of David. Um, and he's going to be a reference to what David is going to represent to Israel, to all of Israel. And, uh, and he says, to be ruler over my people, not his people, my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. So we know what God's been doing for him all along. He's been protecting David, hasn't he? And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. This sounds a lot like God talking to Abraham, doesn't it? Well, it is because there's two important covenants. We have a covenant that God made with, with Abraham and now a covenant that God made with, makes with David. And these are two really strategic parts of the entire Bible. And it kind of lays out the whole plan of God. Now, God's revealing more uh, here through David and uh, what he's going to do. Uh, and he says, your name will be great. Uh, um, the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. What's he saying? What he's saying is, David, you don't understand this yet, but I've called through Abraham my people to this land. Okay, so... Abraham's promise is the land and the things of the land and the tribes living in the land. And now David is bringing it in a little bit tighter to Jerusalem. Not that the plan just encompasses Jerusalem, but what God's going to do to dwell with them in that land, the home, the house, all of that. This speaking of a picture of a future time when the God, this God will dwell with them in their house. And so with this kingly promise, it's going to be a promise that through David would come their king. So David, again, Jesus is called the son of David because this is a reference that when uh, David's uh, you know, kingdom here is turned over to Solomon, um, something is broken. And so we'll see that the, the next true king after David is Jesus, not Solomon. And so when we're reading this, we have to picture that. He's talking about Solomon, who will build the house, but he's also talking about Jesus, who will build the house. So Jesus is going to be the one who builds the eternal house here. Now that house is in the millennial kingdom, speaking of Jesus coming back. And so when he's speaking here again, he says that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. There's going to be a time when Israel will finally be free from all disturbance. It's not going to be during the tribulation that's coming. I mean, come on. I mean, we've just been hearing about um, Iran uh, this last week, and they are openly bold about saying, we want you all to die. You should not be alive on this earth. That is going to be a picture of the nations of the earth coming against Israel. They don't live in peace. 
They've never lived in peace any time in their history. But he's speaking of a time that they will, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. So again, that isn't up till now. That's in the future here, isn't it? Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Speaking of Israel too, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. It's interesting that in Ezekiel, it is King David that comes to be the prince over this rebuilt temple in Israel. And again, the measurements, when we talk about the measurements there, if you read them in Ezekiel, they're much bigger than any temple that's ever been built on the earth. And the, and the grounds that are there, it's a whole new thing. It's for the thousand year reign of Christ. And so we see this speaking of David in a natural sense, uh, coming to Solomon, but also in this future sense as well. So uh, very interesting. Uh, he's going to plant this city. Now, verse 12, when your days are completed and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. So uh, in, the, in the true sense, uh, Solomon will be raised up before David dies because David's going to turn over that kingdom to Solomon. Um, so what's he a reference here to? He's making a reference to this one that will come after you. And again, so both of them are kind of a reference here. You got Solomon and, of course, the coming of Jesus. It says, the descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. So again, it's pointing to Jesus, isn't it? God is excited about this um, because he's already seeing him bringing his son to be the king of Israel. When Jesus came, he came to his own, the Bible says. He didn't come to all the Gentile kingdoms. He came to Israel. And he testified of who he was. He was their king, right? And they, and you know, remember they did it in mockery, but they said, behold, Israel, your king, as they put up there. It was a mockery there. But he was their king, as well as all of the king, king over all of the earth as well. It says, he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It'll be an eternal kingdom. And I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, again, this is not only a reference to Solomon. Solomon, of course, will sin, and the Lord will have to discipline Solomon. But he's also speaking in a reference of Jesus paying for the iniquity or sins of man. He says, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. In other words, there's a reference there that Jesus will be beaten there for the sins of men, for the sins of all men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. It's also a picture to us and a reminder that through all the kings of Israel, they eventually uh, died out. <clears throat> Obviously, Jesus came then and became the the king of kings and the king of Israel and all of that. Um, and, and that has passed away. But um, uh, even in the midst of all of that um, and all of that you know, tumultuousness there, um, it's a reminder that Israel is to have a king and Israel will have God's king and there is an eternal king that's coming and an eternal kingdom. No matter what happens to Israel, We know there's a physical plan on earth for the return of their king. Jesus said, you remember, before he left this earth, he was standing on the Temple Mount. The tabernacle of God was with them. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now you kill the prophets and stone those. How I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. You're not going to see me again until. That means you're going to see me again. Israel's going to see the Lord again. The Bible says they'll look on him whom they pierced. And uh, there's a plan, there's a purpose, and they will see the Lord and their hearts will turn to the Lord. said it many times, but you can remember that in Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11. That's what 
uh, Paul is establishing there. God's not finished with Israel yet. And at one point, all of Israel will be saved. And that's a reference there uh, at the end of the tribulation. Uh, there all of Israel, 100% of those who are alive at the end there, will, will have their hearts turned to the Lord and will be saved. And then God will be able to institute this kingdom that's spoken of here. So very interesting. Um, um, let's keep reading verse 17. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan, Nathan spoke to David. Then David, the king, went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house, that you have brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. David's getting it, isn't he? He's seeing that, God, you have plans that go way beyond me. When I lay down, your plans are still moving forward. And this is the custom of man, O Lord God. Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. <laughs> you know who I am. For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness uh, to let your servant know. In other words, thank you for letting me know this. For this reason, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no, no God beside you according to all that we have heard with our ears. So this meets a heart full of faith like Abraham and he embraces it and he says, let it be, let your will be done, God. I'm humbled that I would be a part of this. Verse 23, and what uh, one nation on earth is like your people, Israel. Isn't that really true though? I mean, there's no nation like Israel on the earth. There's never been one like it. Uh, very uh, unique in all of the world. I was thinking about the United Nations today as I was looking at the news. And uh, when they meet together and uh, President Trump, you know, goes in there, it's kind of like a cesspool, really. I mean, because nobody really believes in it. Um, it. It's become a place that's really been an attack against Israel. I mean, they've had more resolutions against Israel than any other resolutions they've ever passed, by far. And uh, so it's kind of been a place where the nations gather to plot against Israel. And then, you know, for, for Trump, he's like, well, what's, the, what's even the use of even talking to you here? But again, he reiterates and he says, listen, we stand for Israel. And for those who call for their destruction, they stand against us as well. And so uh, I'm very thankful for that uh, because I don't think that'll be the case for America very long. And if we even had other leadership, I'm sure it wouldn't be the case now because there's a big heart in all of the uh, nation here that is anti-Semitic um, because it's the nature of Satan, isn't it? He hates them, wants to wipe them out. He doesn't want Jesus to return. And so he says, what nation on earth is like your people, Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself and to do great things for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, speaking of being delivered from Egypt, from nations and uh, their gods. For you have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever. David gets it, understands what he's saying. God, you're going to fulfill all of the promises of Abraham, and now you're going to do it uh, here as a representation of what's happening in Jerusalem. And the earth will come to worship you here in Jerusalem and you will keep your people. You have an eternal plan for the nation of Israel. It's a physical plan, but yet it's still a spiritual plan, isn't it? Um, because all of those who return to worship the Lord have to die, have to have be in faith in, in the Lord. So there isn't a true, a true, even physical Jewish person isn't saved because they're Jewish. They're saved because they trust in the Lord. And so uh, God's not going to save them because of their physical ancestry, but because their heart will finally turn to the Lord. So, and you, O Lord, have become their God. Now, therefore, O Lord, the, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken, that your name may be magnified forever. That was the purpose of Israel, that the name of God would be magnified over all the earth. 
if they would have represented him. All of the earth would have known the Lord through Israel. The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. So this is about a house that God's going to build through David. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are truth and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord, God, I have spoken and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. So we'll stop there tonight. Very interesting, very prophetic, very revealing. Uh, again, this second covenant, um, this promises that were made, both in the physical and the spiritual. And David represents the physical house of Israel, and Jesus represents the spiritual house of Israel, doesn't he? And uh, there's a promise of an eternal physical kingdom, and there's also a promise of a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus will fulfill both of those, won't he? And uh, so, very interesting. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you again tonight. Thank you for your promises. True to your word, you came and you tabernacled among us. Uh, God in the flesh. And we did not behold you in the physical, but now we behold you in the spiritual. And we see, Lord, your promises fulfilled in your son Jesus, that you were not only building um, a, a nation, but you were building a kingdom that's over all of the earth. And, and Lord, now we as most of us Gentiles, Lord, have come in to that kingdom. And one day we'll rule and reign with you in your church. Thank you, Lord, that you have you know, built this spiritual kingdom made of Jews and Gentiles. And one day you're going to come back physically to rule over a kingdom, a people, Israel, physically. And we'll get to rule and reign with you in your kingdom. Your king, your God, your Lord. And as David, we want to accept this by faith. Trust you at your word, Lord. Looking forward to what your plans are in the future. One day we'll lay our lives down. But Lord, you'll take them up again and we'll dwell with you forever. That's, that's good news. We praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together.